Hello. That's loud. Okay, good. Uh, so uh, we have Jeff Koffler and Andrew uh, from Microsoft uh, sharing their experiences with their work on um, uh, Windows, uh, Mesos on Windows, uh, as well as the CMake build system. So I'm going to hand it off to them and they can get started. Thanks. So uh, I was Andrew, and this to my left is Jeff. And we have some cohorts here, Paul Allen, but not the Paul Allen. Um, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. As he pointed out, he's the only Paul Allen in our group. <laughs> and then uh, Lee Lee, who's, the, um, who's our manager. All right, so as, um, this is really loud. Is this? Okay. Is that okay? Turn it off. Oh, okay. How's that? Okay, so we're here to talk about uh, Mesos on Windows and our experiences with it so far. So, why add Windows support to Mesos? Um, well, as you can see, we have customers that are interested in Windows. Um, we're not fundamentally modifying Mesos in any way. What we're doing is we are bringing up a Mesos agent on Windows. So if you have an existing Mesos cluster, it's the same Mesos cluster you're, you're used to. You can use it in the same ways. You simply have the ability to add Windows nodes and Windows workloads to that. Um, using, um, using Mesos, you can um, uh, select Windows using the typical Mesos features, um, you know, OS, CPU speeds, other criteria. Um, and again, I wanted to emphasize it's the standard Mesos you know. We're simply adding an agent for, uh, for Windows. A little bit of history. You can read the slides. Basically, when we started, it was started as a straight port. So, for example, auto tools wouldn't work properly on uh, Windows. So they did a complete straight port of basically what auto tools was doing um, into CMake. Um, since then, we've come across and we've heavily modified that, mo modified that and made it much, much cleaner, and Andy will talk about that in a little, in a little bit. Um, where are we now? Um, as you can see, we have the Mesos containerizer that supports job objects. Not quite the same level of isolation as you would get with Linux, but the best we can do on, on Windows. It supports Docker today. We're going to demo that. Um, we have CMake, NTFS long paths are working in a much less hacky way. You don't have to modify the registry any longer. Um, uh, and uh, we are, there's a team of people that are actively working on Mesos every day, um, pushing changes into the master branch. To add to that job object support, so what I want to really make clear here is that we're trying to bring the best of both worlds, like the expectations you would have using the Mesos containerizer, but also the expectations you have using Windows in general. So the fact that we don't have C groups is not really a problem. We're just doing the closest thing next to it, which is sticking uh, processes into job objects so you could run a raw process on your Windows machine. What that can give you is resource limitations. Um, I have that prototype right now. You can set a hard cap on like your CPU and your memory usage, but you don't get like the C group namespaces that you might have on Linux simply because that's not a thing on Windows. We don't have uh, namespaces in that way. On the other hand, the Docker containerizer totally works. Um, the Windows container support that the rest of Microsoft has managed to get working quite well uh, is supported pretty natively here as well. Okay. Um, so here's a brief demonstration or, or an example. Um, on the left, we have a, a relatively standard Marathon JSON file. Um, it's launching, I think you can maybe see okay, it's launching Microsoft IIS on a Windows system. Uh, the window on the bottom right is IIS running, and the window on the top right shows Docker running in um, an IIS container started by the uh, Mesos agent. All right? So here's a little more sophisticated example. Here we have a hybrid DCOS cluster deployment. So here, when we're, when we're deploying services, we use constraints like OS like Windows, OS like Linux. Um, 
and that serves into specific services that are running. Uh, the one that says Microsoft is obviously the run running run Windows, and the one that says uh, Basic Zero is the run that's running Linux in this example. Uh, so here you can see we have nodes. One, uh, one of the nodes, of course, is a Linux node. One of the nodes is a Windows node. And here's a perfect example of we haven't fundamentally changed Mesos in any way. We're simply adding the ability to run Windows workloads within your existing Mesos Linux clusters. We're expanding that ecosystem. Go ahead so, and build some um, improvements. Now, we kind of had to squash two talks into one. So one of, this, uh, one of the things we've had to do for Windows was, of course, implement a new build system. Auto tools uh, on Windows is not really a thing. It wouldn't be a proper build. Windows, you generally use you know, Visual Studio Solutions or whatever you're targeting. And this actually worked out really well because there's been a movement in the greater open source community and in Mesos itself to kind of start replacing auto tools. It's a great system. I, I do love auto tools. It's GPL. But CMake is a lot higher level. It's a meta build generator. It lets you define at a really high level your build with not much code. And then you generate the build files for the target platform you're on. If you're on Windows, you get MS Build Solutions that you can open up in Visual Studio. If you're on Linux, you can use Make Files. Um, if you're on Linux, you can also use the Ninja Build uh, system if you want. If you're over on Mac, this doesn't work quite yet, but CMake supports generating Xcode solutions there as well, so you could open it up in your preferred IDE, kind of just however you want. And the nice key part is you don't have to care what your platform is. CMake has a nice little consistent uh, interface to use. I actually, I really like this. Um, I think it's on my next slide. It is on my next slide. Uh, I do want to point out, while CMake is, brings a lot of consistency to building, there are still, I don't want to call them hacks, but there are still fundamental differences between some build systems, right? So debug and release configurations are something I recently enabled in CMake. And unfortunately, although most things are consistent, there is a difference between like single configuration generators and multi-configuration generators. In a make file build system, you configure a folder for your build at configuration time you choose if you're going to have a debug or release build. So you can set a variable. Other platforms like Visual Studio, you can open that up in a drop-down menu, switch between debug and release at build time. So while there's a lot of consistency, these two commands are different for the debug and release configurations. And I'm also going through and documenting this so that people, as we switch over to CMake, well, if you want to learn how to change your build, I'll have the explanation of exactly what you need to do here. Um, other recent improvements that I've made were supporting the Java bindings. So uh, up until maybe a month ago, if you built the CMake master, the Mesos master on Linux using CMake, you couldn't use Marathon because we didn't have Java support whatsoever. So I brought over the Java bindings just so all the projects that are using those are now supported. Uh, the other things we've done, I've really to, been targeting to speed up the build. Um, when I started on this, December last year or so, the Windows build would take close to an hour to finish. Uh, so we have gone through and we added pre-compiled header support because one thing that does happen a lot on Windows is that the compiler chokes on complex headers. If you use Stout, um, if you use Mesos, you know about Stout, our giant header-only library. So our pre-compiled headers have cut down a lot of the build time. Jeff helped me out with that as well. Um, the nice thing with it is it uses a CMake module called Kotire. We don't actually change any source files. It's just a configuration time header that's generated and included on the command line when it's built. It's nice and automatic. Uh, after going through and fixing up the CMake dependency graph, which was a mess, uh, our link times are actually on par with Linux. I did a fresh build from nothing earlier today on a reasonably fast machine. It was about 18 minutes. I still want to get that down, but going from an hour to 18 minutes, I'm really, really happy. Um, so to dive into some of this. Well, before you move on, I wanted to point out a couple things. <clears throat> CMake allows you to build using MS Build. And very typically, projects that use MS Build actually check in VC projects that are tied to a, specific, to a specific version of Visual Studio. One of the nice things that uh, CMake gives you is it just builds with the video, Visual Studio already installed on your machine, so you don't really have to worry about it. Now, in our particular case with Mesos, we actually need the latest version of Visual Studio because we're using some compiler fixes in the very latest version. But in the normal world, you know, when we move beyond Visual Studio 2017, um, you know, conceivably, if we don't have to take the newest version because of some dependency, you can be a little more relaxed about what version you're running. 
That's actually a great point. Uh, we're not doing this just for Mesos, but also for a lot of our dependencies. Zookeeper, I ran into a problem of on, on Windows originally. We just added a patch to Mesos to patch Zookeeper on the fly to add a hard-coded Visual Studio 2015 solution. That's not maintainable, because as soon as I wanted to go to 2017, what was I going to do, generate a new patch? And if somebody wants to use go back to 2015, do I have to tell them to check out old source? No, instead, I deleted the solution entirely. I pushed a new CMake build upstream to Zookeeper. I worked with, uh, I think it was Michael Hahn of the Zookeeper project. It's integrated. Um, I got it back to the version of Zookeeper we're using, and we'll be patchless soon, as soon as we can just update our Zookeeper bundle. So we're doing this from top to bottom. We're trying to do it right. Um, so to go into some of the more specifics, a lot of people might question, why, why switch to CMake? Why use it at all? Uh, I touched on this a little bit earlier, it's consistent, it's easy to use. When I go to Linux, I don't have to remember make check, I can just run cmake dash dash build dot dash dash target mesos test. That might be a bit longer than make check, but that will also work on Windows. I can go to PowerShell and run the exact same command and it will build the exact same target for me. Uh, so as a developer, that higher level abstraction makes working a lot easier. Uh, yeah, it's really quite nice. It's built for C and C++. Um, and what I mean is it takes care of a lot of the rote things that you might be used to in auto tools having to specify all of your headers. That's automatic. Your compiler can look at your source files and deduce what headers you need to include on uh, when you're building that object, right? Well, CMake just runs your compiler and sees what you need to include. So you don't have to specify all these .hpps all over the place. They're just gone. They're figured out for you. It, it's, it's a beautiful little system. Uh, mentioned ninja builds too. I did. Yeah. I also supported ninja builds. There's a, I'm not sure if he's a committer. There's an active Mesos community member named Benjamin Banier who really wanted to use Ninja. It's an amazing little build system for Linux. It's like Make, but with a lot better dependency checking. Uh, and it's really good at maximizing utilization of your processor without, with automatic parallelization without a lot of thrashing going on. So Ninja is supported as well. Uh, those are now, these patches are all upstream in master branch of Mesos. You can use this today. It's, I had a lot of fun with it. So the other thing with CMake was if you looked at the code previously, um, we touched on this a little early on, the original port over to Windows, they looked through the auto tools files and they kind of just wrote, copied it. When auto tools said include these directories, they made a CMake file that said include these directories. Yes, that worked, we had a working build, but it's not the way you would normally use CMake. They kind of skip past all the high level abstractions you can use in CMake to generate a nice build system for yourself. So I spent the last couple months uh, rewriting it. It's been completely refactored. We now actually use real CMake targets. So, but what I mean by that is Stout is our header only library. Uh, usually with a header only library, you need to remember that for every dependency that uses this header only library to specify in its compilation flags like in your make file, hey, pound include, well, not pound include, dash i, the stout folder. You don't do that in CMake. In CMake, there is a CMake list file for stout. We say add library stout interface. We have one more line that says target include directory, the include folder for stout. Anything else that needs to depend on stout can link to it like a normal library. You say target link libraries lib process stout. It's picked up for you automatically. It goes into the dependency graph when lib process needs, when lib mesos needs to then link to lib process, you don't specify it again. It's just picked up. There's a proper graph underneath it. Um, I also went through and did that for all the rest of our third party dependencies. As you know, there's probably, what, 20, I think we counted, different dependencies under third party that we bundle or find on the system. All those are properly imported as real targets. That seems like it would add a lot of code, but by doing that, I was able to delete giant files. Uh, over a thousand lines of unnecessary code was deleted in my refactor, and to make that number actually seem, uh, to give you perspective here, I added 200 lines. So I replaced at like a five to one ratio of high level build code. Uh, it's, well, I have screenshots to show you <laughs> of what this looked like in the refactor. The left, the totally unreadable code, was the totally unreadable CMake build. It worked, it was a really, really good first go, it got us working on Windows, it started this whole process. I couldn't have done what I did without the previous developers writing this. But once we had it there, I noticed it was just unmaintainable. People wanting to add a new third-party dependency were giving up. 
Um, I would go and help them. I'd try to explain how to do it. I'm like, you know what? No, I can make this easier. I know I can make this easier. This is the new code for uh, the Mesos agent. That's it. That's the whole file. There's a Apache license header above it. But if you go to the agent folder, source slave, that is the file you'll find. Add executable, Mesos agent, main.cpp. That's the source file that you use to build the Mesos agent. The only other bit of information you need to tell it is that it depends on the Mesos library. All of the dependencies that libmesos has are picked up through the graph. When you build Mesos agent, it's just figured out and generated for you. I don't want to say magically, but it works like magic. Um, the add subdirectory pieces are just the fact that CMake is kind of like auto tools. The right way you do it is a CMake list file per folder per target that you need. So that just tells you, hey, there's three folders in here with more targets. I included it because it was in the original. Um, those are two different files, actually, both of which were required. This middle file is completely deleted. Uh, it was the agent configure file. It had a bunch of magic variables for the third party information. I just get RM'd it. And all of that information, much of it was redundant. The link directories, the target link libraries, the ad dependencies, it just comes from the graph. They include directories. That just comes from the graph. It turned into those two lines. It was really something. Um, the other comparison I want to make is to auto tools, which is a nice little build system. But like I said, CMake is a really high level meta build generator. It figures out your headers. So this is the relevant parts of the make file that I could find for building the Mesos agent in auto tools. Comparing it to the right hand side over here, this is a lot easier to reason about and maintain. Those headers are just figured out. The proto libraries are part of the Mesos proto bus, which is the library that libmesos links to. Why do you need to specify it again? You really don't. Why do you need to specify the Mesos CPP flags for the Mesos agent? If those are project-wide flags, they're picked up for you. So uh, CMake is a nice build system. It's far from perfect. There are hacks. There's always hacks in a build system. I'm going through and documenting those. They're commented in the code, but part of my hackathon project on Wednesday here was to actually pull all of that out. Um, I'm also going to have a CMake by example to show you, hey, you want to add a third party library? Here's how to do it. Um, I don't have a slide for third party libraries, but I wanted to point out that a lot of what I did uh, to fix the third party libraries was to localize the information. So for glock, uh, one of our third party dependencies, that takes a, quite a bit of setup. The setup used to be split among a few different files, in libprocess, in third party, in the source files. Instead, when done properly, it's a set of maybe 12 lines of code in third party CMake lists that say, hey, we have this project called glog. It's a shared library. We build it in this way. The source comes from here. We import it as a CMake target. Stout later can just say target link libraries, stout, glog. Anything that links to Stout, which again, header-only library, but in Mesos it doesn't, in CMake it doesn't matter, picks up the dependency for you and just knows how to link it and how to build it. It's fantastic. Now, CMake is really, really cool, but it's obviously cool. I love it. Um, the other work that we've done to improve the Mesos build for all of us is to add a review bot for Windows. Uh, in January, I say every three or four days I pulled master sources and somebody committed a patch that didn't build on Windows and I had to drop what I was doing and fix it again. And I don't blame anyone. Nobody was testing it for them and I can't make everybody test their stuff on Windows. So instead, we added a real review bot. It's like the Linux review bot you know and love for Linux. It just does it on Windows for you as well. It's been up and the amount of times I've had to fix a build break in master for Windows has gone down dramatically. I think it's like once a month now. Uh, we've also been working to get nightly builds of the Mesos binaries available for Windows. So if you want to test this project, we'll have binaries available that you can just go and build. Um, part of what I want to work with Vnode is we're getting Apache Software Foundation CI up too, right, for packages. Eventually, as this project goes along, we'll have packages you can use to install Mesos too. Uh, I think that was my next slide, continuous integration for Windows. Working with Mesosphere, specifically Joe, he also helped us set up uh, CI for Windows as well, so we know when our tests are passing. Oh, I think it's in the next slide, but um, do you want to talk about the tests? Was that for you? I was going to point out, we have not as many tests on Windows as we have on Linux. 630 versus 1,400 Mesos, that's Mesos tests. Yeah, I think it's like 1,400 on Linux. So at like a rough glance, it might look like 50% test coverage, but we're actually still in the process of porting Mesos to Windows. 
as we port components, like um, as we port over lib process, as we port over the fetcher, we're porting all the tests with it. Um, so that 630 tests represents a much higher amount of coverage for the components that we have working on Windows. Maybe 70, 80%. I'd have to actually dig into numbers. Uh, but don't fret if you only see 630 tests. We, we're trying to keep our coverage pretty high. I'm going to pass this back over to Jeff to give you a case study. I don't need that. Okay, so one thing I missed mentioning, by the way, is we're very engaged with the Mesos community. Um, we work closely with them. Our changes are committed to mainline after careful review and discussion. Uh, we are active on the dev lists. We are active in architectural changes that, that are being discussed. Um, and basically our goal is to work very closely with the open source community to make sure that what we're doing is something that everybody is comfortable with. Um, here we have a case study, CTRIP International. Really the point of this slide is just to point out this stuff works. It's there today. We have customers using it under production today. Um, so it's there, it works. If you guys want to play with it and see, see, uh, see it in action, you can do that right now today. We wouldn't necessarily recommend running it in production, but there are people doing it. Okay, I'm gonna do a demonstration of a hybrid cluster. All right, uh, so here we have um, a couple of different nodes, and if we select one of the nodes, go to details, you can see under attributes the OS is Linux. And if we select a different node, here you see under attributes the OS is Windows. So we have some services here. And using the, um, the constraint that I mentioned, we have uh, some two services set up. One is for IIS with a constraint that it has to run on Windows, and one is for Nginx with a constraint that it has to run on Linux. Um, so basically, these are typical DCOS services. Uh, you launch it with a JSON file, uh, just like you guys are comfortable with. And here is a window uh, that shows it running on Linux. And to prove it's real, I will refresh. And they're refreshed. I'm sure it's not cached. It's not cached. In fact, here, let's go to Nginx and suspend it. And then we'll go to IAS and suspend it as well. So now we have two suspended services. And if I go back to Linux and try and refresh, cannot open page. A working live demo. A working live demo. Here, interestingly enough, you see the progress bar is having problems loading. It will eventually time out. But uh, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to say resume Nginx. I'm going to come back here and refresh. Uh-oh. Oh, it's still deploying. There you go. Yeah, good demo. So here. <laughs> And then um, you can see that, uh, that Windows is still having problems loading if you look at the progress bar. So I'm gonna go back and resume IAS. Wait for it to deploy this time. Okay. And then here, it's still having problems loading. I'm gonna kill that and refresh. Oh, come on. There you go. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, this shows IAS running on, uh, on Windows. So that's the demonstration. Uh, did want to point out, go back here, go back to nodes. This, um, this cluster just had, you know, it started as with just Linux nodes, and the Windows nodes were just added to it without any changes to the master. Okay, whoops. Better. Okay, so what's next? Um, we're actively working on adding authentication support. Hasn't, um, I don't think that's made it to master yet, but it's, it's tested and working and I think Patches it's out for review. For Patches are up for it. Uh, uh, CRAM MD5 is supported. 
and we're working on uh, additional authentication uh, methods using plugins, just like on Linux. Um, some upcoming DC, uh, DCOS services we're looking at is Metrics, Barton, and Navstar. Um, and uh, uh, I'm working on getting the Fetcher deployed on Windows. Um, patches are almost up for that. Uh, and I did want to uh, emphasize what Andy said, increase unit test coverage by porting more tests. Um, I always start, like when I started with the Fetcher, the very, very, very first thing I did was ported all the tests, see what failed, and, I'm, and, and as part of my work, I'm fixing those. And I have something like 30 tickets in JIRA to look at all the tests that we may have ported and forgot to close the tickets on. So yeah, we're getting through it. Uh, the other thing we're doing, of course, is planning the eventual deprecation of auto tools in CMake, for, in favor of CMake, so that we don't have to maintain two build systems simultaneously. So that'll come along as well. Yeah, that's something that we're working with the community for. It's gonna be a while, um, but, but it is something that I think not just Microsoft would appreciate, but the developers would appreciate as well. Okay, there's some resources that you could look at if you'd like. Um, GitHub.com slash Microsoft slash Mesos has some interesting pointers for uh, Mesos stuff. Here's some DCOS links that you could look at as well. Um, their, their Windows repository is available as well. Um, and the ACS engine uh, allows you to very, very quickly deploy um, DCOS clusters. Um, just takes a few commands to do that. That's work that Paul has been working to uh, enable. Yes, our Paul Allen. Yeah, this Paul Allen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where are we going from here? Um, really, we're very, very customer driven. We'd like the customer and the community to decide. Uh, if a customer has very, very specific uh, usage scenarios, we would really like to engage with you and hear what they are so we can meet your needs. Um, you can join us on the Meso Slack channel. Um, uh, Windows is a, a common one, although we hang out on most of them. Um, uh, at, right after this, um, uh, this presentation, we're going to the booth. If you have any particular questions, please join us at the booth, and we're happy to discuss stuff with you. Thank you for coming. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Uh, why don't you give him the mic so it's recorded? So you said now you could build Mesos Agent on Windows. When is the master going to be ready, or is it already ready? I love that question. All right, so a lot of the master code I know builds because most of the unit tests require spinning up parts of the master to build. Uh, the Mesos master executable right now, I mean the CMake file is just, if not Windows. I would like to try it. It's something I'd like to experiment with. We don't have a huge customer demand to have the master building on Windows because most of these people, most of you lovely people out there, really already have Mesos clusters with your masters up in Lin on Linux and deployed and just want Windows agents added to it. So priority-wise, it may not be our highest thing, but the big troublesome part about bringing the master over to Windows is its dependency on level DB, which we've looked at and are like, oh, that might need to be ported. <laughs> so it depends on where we get with that. Does anyone have any other questions? Why don't you walk the mic back? Thanks. Uh, I'm just wondering if, uh, like I saw it during the demo demonstration, that it had, uh, I think, one CPU, 128 megs of RAM. Uh, are those actually being honored right now in Windows when that's running, uh, either through Docker or through the kind of native Windows deployments? So the answer to that question, um, Mike, is this Mike catching me? Thanks. Yes, uh, they're real numbers. That is the actual Docker container. Um, Docker being ported to Windows, we just kind of shell out to Docker. So any isolation or resource limitations you set for the Docker containerizer work. Uh, the job objects, that's coming. I have a branch up that I've tested. I, I ran a process that is supposed to use as much RAM as it can, and I set with my branch a hard limit of like, nope, stop at a one gigabyte of RAM, totally stopped right there. So that's in process and will come along probably in the next month or so, but we're working to make sure all those resource limitations are real, live, reported correctly, and can be used. That way. 
Uh, you showed a, a client that was already running uh, this in production. Um, are they running that on Azure Container Services or are they running that on-prem? Uh, they running on-prem. They're running that on-prem? Okay. Why don't you actually give it a Yeah, the case study that we showed there is actually on-prem customer. And then currently, we're also working on some uh, DCOS customers as well. Uh, I think that will come in qu pretty quickly next. I will imagine that the timeline to really let them to use our product, uh, DCOS uh, product in, in their production might be sometime, you know, um, April or May time frame. But uh, the lower, uh, lower layer, like Mesos, uh, layer has been in the production already. Any other questions? I was curious about uh, the GPU support, if you guys uh, know how does that work on Windows. No GPU support yet. Um, I like that you asked that though, because now I can make a ticket to look at it eventually. So if you have a particular request or a requirement, I will in encourage you to follow up with us on either a Slack channel uh, or you know send an email to Andy and Jeff, and then uh, we'll work with you closely to support the scenarios that you want to support. Uh, we have a lot of things at least there that we want to target next. But uh, if you have uh, you know more concrete requirements, and then a it can change the priority of our things on our list as well. We are open to listen, and then we actually like to work with customers to support those scenarios. Um, let's trade it back. So uh, I was just curious about what, what are the big items for moving or dropping auto tools that are left? Uh, I don't have Python bindings working yet, so that might be a bigger item to work on. Um, other than that, we're getting really close, actually. There's obviously a lot of effort to go into making sure the whole community can use CMake comfortably. Uh, that's part of why I'm here. I want to ask you all to try it out. I want to make sure that it works as well as it can for you. I think it's a great build system. I know it's far from perfect. And I know I'm really the, as the one who rewrote it, I tested it for my scenarios. I try to test as many other scenarios as I could, but please try it out in the real world. Give it a whirl. Um, let me know if something's missing that you need so I can go at it. We do have an epic tracking the technical issues that we found so far, but yeah. There is, I wanted to add, I mean, we do have review bot running, obviously that uses CMake every single day. Uh, at Microsoft, we obviously use CMake every single day because that's all that works on Windows. Um, so, you know, it is working. Um, it, it, it's working for what we need, it doesn't, have everything that Auto Tools have. And I don't know if we're ever going to completely replace that because Auto Tools does a lot. We just want to replace what's actively used. So, uh, kind of tying into what you just said, when, when do you think we can get rid of Auto Tools completely? Or at the very least, switch over all the docs on, uh, on the uh, Mesos site to say, hey, you see make, like, don't even talk about Auto Tools. The number that I've heard thrown out talking to some maintainers is probably on about a six month time frame to do that, to say, hey, by default, please use CMake uh, and use it without, you know, of course, deleting the audit tool stuff. Um, beyond that, we kind of need to see, once people start adopting it widespread, how long it'll take to get rid of all the rest of, uh, replace all the rest of audit tools. So six months-ish to default. Any other questions? Thanks very much for joining us.